This is the fourth part of today's session on vision and attention. After we've talked about visual attention in general and the spatial cueing paradigm, we will now talk about other attentional paradigms and also the theories of visual attention that were derived from these paradigms. One of these paradigms is the attentional blink paradigm by Jane Raymond. It measures the temporal bottleneck in attention. So if you remember, we need attention because we cannot process everything at the same time to the same extent. Now the question is, of course, how long is this bottleneck? So how long does it um, require us to process a stimulus before the next stimulus can be processed? And this was tested with this um, task here. So in this task, people see a very fast succession of characters, of digits and letters. So there were only a few hundred milliseconds in between each of these digits and letters. And participants only had to report the letters. So the letters were the targets, the digits were the distractors. And the critical manipulation here would be the lag between the first target and the second target, T1 and T2. So the task in this example would be to report D and A. And the lag in this case would be 3 because the second car target comes 1, 2, 3 items after the first target. Now what you can see here is the performance for T2 as a function of how many items were between T1 and T2, the lag. And as you can see, when T1 is presented right after T1, the performance is relatively good for T2. But at lag 2 and 3, the performance is very bad. So this is what we call the attentional blink. It's like a blink when you blink with your eyes, but it's an attentional blink because your eyes are not really closed. It is just that your attention is not ready to perceive new input. And the idea is that T1 is still being processed here, and thus we do not have sufficient resources to process T2. But then, as time goes by, there's more and more resources available, because T1 is finished processing, and then T2 can be processed as well. Importantly, this is only, um, this dip is in performance is only observed if T1 is actually attended. So only if participants report the correct T1, in this case D, you see this dip in performance. And here the reasoning would be that if you do not attend T1, then obviously T1 doesn't need any resources and all of the resources are available to already process T2 at an earlier point in time. Interestingly, you can actually help the visual system or attention to recover more quickly. This was tested in this experiment by Cooper and colleagues. So um, they used TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, to activate the intraparietal sulcus, IPS. And when they did that, this is the um, empty diamonds you can see here. That's TMS. And the black squares here is no TMS and as you can see the dip in performance is less severe with this TMS. So there is a facilitated recovery due to the TMS impulse over the IPS region. A possible explanation is that the dorsal stream that is processing task relevant information just like the T1 here for example is busy from processing T1, so the TMS signal makes the dorsal stream recover more quickly. Now, we have talked about the queuing paradigm that was important to investigate very basic mechanisms of visual attention, for example, the time course, so how long does it take to shift attention, and also to differentiate between exogenous and endogenous factors. But um, a paradigm in which you only present one stimulus, more or less, is maybe reflecting some very special real-world situations well. For example, when you're on this um, 
field of barley or something and there's a poppy flower then there's only one object and it's very easy to select that object just like in a queuing task but the real challenges for the visual system really occur when there's a lot of competition between objects um, for example like in this scene here and there's actually very many everyday situations where we have to try to find uh, some information and it is difficult because that object we do not we do not know where it is and it is competing for our attention with other objects that are potentially um, more salient. And this is what we call a visual search task. Searching for a predefined specific object among other objects that are so, uh, so to say distractors. So as an example you're at your desk and you want to go home from work and you need to find your keys um, then you need to search them on your desk and try to ignore all other objects. Or you're at Times Square and you want to find your friend and there's of course very many other objects that can potentially distract you. Or you're looking for a specific app on your phone for a program on your desktop and need to um, ignore all the irrelevant objects here. And sometimes visual search can even be a matter of life and death. For example, when you're a doctor who screens women for breast cancer, they need to detect tumors in such ultrasound um, images. Or if you're a security officer at an airport, you need to uh, detect and find weapons in a bag in the um, X-ray X-ray uh, luggage. Uh, images. So the visual search task is so to say a lab simulation of real-world situations. Um, but because we're in the lab we want to physically well control all our um, properties of our task. So instead of for example in the real world where we would ask where's the red Lego brick so in this case this would be the target and all the other Lego bricks would be the distractors. In the lab we would have some kind of abstract version of that where the target for example is a red rectangle and all the other geometric shapes here are the distractors. And this visual search task was very influential um, to reveal which factors affect visual attention. Here you can see some examples from throughout the literature, from the starting in the, um, in the 1980s up until now. Um, at first glance, they all look very different, and this is due to the specific research questions they tackled. But they have one thing in common, namely that some target need to, needs to be found, and some um, some distractors need to be um, ignored. Okay, again we can do a demo of this visual search task. So here the task is to say whether there was a red T or not as quickly as possible. Okay, that was relatively easy. There's a red T here. Please note that it can also be oriented in different ways. Let's do another one. Okay, as you probably noticed relatively quickly, there's no red T here. Let's do this one. A lot of items, but it was still a lot of distractors, but it was still probably relatively easy for you to detect the red T here. Okay, the red T is here. This was maybe a bit more difficult for you. Maybe you can think about why this was the case. And let's do this one. Okay, the T is here. 
So even though the task was always the same, the arrangement of the distractors and the features of the distractors pretty much determined probably how fast you did find the t. So if you increase the number of distractors, search could be more difficult if you th if you think about it because it's just more to more to look at, more distractors to reject. But actually here there's usually no effect found. And when I say here, I mean those trials in which all the distractors had the same color and that is a different color from the target. But if there were also distractors that had the same color as the target, then the performance becomes much worse, that is longer response times, if you add distractors. Now based on these findings, the feature integration theory was conceived by Anne Treisman and colleagues. So she distinguished between different kinds of feature, um, between different kinds of search types. So the single feature search would be possible when the target does not share any features with the distractor, just like here. So this is a parallel search. You can basically process all the items in the visual field in parallel, which is of course relatively fast. So if you increase the number of distractors, there's no increase in the response time because you can still process them parallelly. The reason is that the target pops out and the parallel search um, is thus very efficient regardless of how many distractors you have. Sometimes, however, you need to apply what is called conjunction search. So if a target shares features with the distractors, then it doesn't really pop out here. And if you increase the number of distractors, then the search time will increase like this. So this is because now there is a serial search going on um, because we do not, we cannot just process everything at once. We need to go through all the single items until we do find the target. And attention, according to this feature integration theory, is the glue that combines the different features. For example, color and shape are combined to, um, say, a red target, a red T, or a blue L, for example. So this refers to what William James um, said um, about attention, namely that attention has a limited capacity. So because of the limited capacity, the conjunction search, in the conjunction search, we have an increased number of items. So in the feature integration theory, we have some visual input here. This is one of the more difficult searches because we have um, distractors in the same color as the target. And then we have a neural representation of all the different features. So for, for example, of color, curvature, orientation, motion, and so on. So these feature maps, they are pre-attentive which means there is some representation of them before attention is applied and they can be processed in parallel and without awareness. Now what attention as the glue, as the, as the glue that combines different features from the maps does is it can move around to different points in, in our visual field and then uh, when, for example, attention is deployed to this location, then it can get input from all the different feature maps and combine them to one mental representation on the master map. But without attention, we do not have a common representation of, for example, orientation um, and color, which would be required to detect the target here, because here we cannot just rely on just color. and then we can move attention to a different spot and then for example here combine 
um, the features from objects presented at that location. And this results in object perception then. So what happens if we have this pop-out scenario here where all the distractors are identical and have a different color from the target? So again, um, the distractors and the target are represented on these feature maps, but we, don't, we do not need to access the master map because merely the presence of a single red item already indicates that there is a target. We do not need to take distractors of the same color into consideration. So, and this is why it's faster and in parallel. There's also something called illusory conjunctions that was used as further evidence to support Anne Treisman's model, um, the feature integration theory. If there's not enough time for attention to be deployed to a specific location to glue two features together, they can actually be accidentally combined to illusory conjunctions. So for example, the perception of a red N and a green S may be um, conjoined to a green N. So um, if you present these items here, what um, a person that didn't pay attention well it was briefly presented would be a green N because green of this object was combined with the letter identity of this object. In the attention literature, as you've seen, there was a large number of different um, search tasks used and um, again, the aim was here to determine how the attentional resources are deployed under which circumstances. And all these visual search uh, tasks derive from Anne Treisman's um, original task. So she was very influential and had a very important impact on visual attention theories. There were also some challenges to the feature integration theory later. For example, in a study by Wolf and colleagues, they had this kind of search task I'm going to show you. So the target would be a green horizontal line. So here the target is present. Here's another example. Again, the target is present here. Now, the result here that Wolf and colleagues found was that the slope, so how much the search time or the reaction time increases with the increase of the set size of the number of distractors, um, that depended on the subject. So some subjects, for example, showed a very shallow slope. So the subject A in this example, it's almost um, as if increasing the set size doesn't really affect them. Well, whereas another subject, B, quite a, quite a large increase here. So this cannot be explained by the feature integration theory. Um, also note that they are not linear here. It's like a exponential function. So the feature integration theory was revised by Wolf and colleagues to the guided search model, which is nowadays the most influential visual search or visual attention model. In guided search, you still have these feature maps, like in feature integration theory, but they are weighted and then forward their information to something called an attention map. So, for example, if you are looking for a green target, then all the locations that have green have a relatively high activation. You can see this here. All the gray items here have a high activation because there's green presented here. We also know that the target is a horizontal line. So all the horizontal lines are also having a relatively high activation compared to the vertical lines that are white, represented white here. 
There's also a feature map for other features, for other dimensions, like size, for example, but because size is not important, there's no representation here, or that representation is at least not forwarded to the attention map. Now, if we look at the summed activation on the attention map, you can see that there's one conspicuous location, namely where these two um, activation maps overlap the most. So this location is most highly activated because it both shows a correct orientation and the correct color. So what happens now in guided search is that attention is still directed serially just like in feature integration theory but it's not randomly it's based on the attention map here. So the order of attention deployment is determined by the summed salience. This is this is um, this is the summed salience. So in this example, attention would first be deployed here because this seems to be the most likely location for the target to be presented. This also means that there's no qualitative difference between feature and conjunction search. But the slopes vary from very flat to very steep due to the signal to noise ratio. So in this example this is very clear cut. You have only two different colors, light gray and dark gray, but because um, the representation of stimuli is always a bit noisy, it could also be that attention under certain circumstances is not directed to the target first, but to some other location. F just as an example, if there is a line that is not horizontal, but almost horizontal, and also green, then it might also have a relatively high activation and then because of the additional noise it could be that this item is attended first. Now let's have a look at the situation when there is a singleton. So in this case, in, as found by Entreesman, this search should be relatively easy. It pops out and this can also be explained by, explained by the guided search theory because what happens here is that you have a very high representation of the item on the color map because there's no competition between green items. There's only one green item so that green item can get a very high activation without being inhibited by other green items. Orientation will be the same but as a result you can see that now the relative difference between the distractors, the light gray and white, and the black location where the target is presented, this difference is larger. So as a result, attention can be directed faster here and less error prone. So it's less likely that due to noise, for example, this uh, attentional spotlight would be directed to a different location first. So from guided search there were more complex models suggested in the following. They're all inspired by the feature integration theory and guided search. Um, this is for example a computational model by Etienne Koch which was also very influential. Um, here items from the visual field are represented on a topographic map. So this would be the topographic map as a representation of the actual input. This is what the retina would get. And then features like color, orientation, or shape are represented on distinct maps, similar to this one here. Attention is first deployed to the item with the highest activity. So, um, I don't know, in this case, might be this one here, for example. And importantly, goals and intentions are also highlighted here. So they result in some feature maps having a higher weight. So, for example, due to top-down attentional bias, this is basically our voluntary influence, how we affect the weighting of different features, um, then the distribution of activities on the saliency map can be um, manipulated. So, for example, if you are looking for, um, well, let's say, red leaves, then you could just increase the weight of red feature maps. 
so for example this red map here and then you would have a very high activation for these bits here because they are orange so they would appear with a high activation here but if you're looking for something completely different then the saliency map might also look very different so this model really highlights the input of both um, physical salience how distinct is an object physically but also our um, voluntary influence on the attention distribution so for example what we are looking for what is our current goal uh, which is termed top-down attentional bias here so much about the visual search task and attention other attention paradigms and attentional models in the last part of today's session we will look at neural measures of attention